Welcome to AOCS Webinar Wednesday. Today's presentation is the development of a robust spectrometer for online and real-time monitoring of oil quality. I am Janet Brown, AOCS Director of Membership, and I want to thank all of you for attending the webinar. All attendees are in are, are muted, so please type your questions in the chat area and we will take your questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jonathan Speed with Kite Spectrometers, is a product and applications manager. Jonathan um, has been, um, he's, he's both a chemistry, he has, he has both a chemistry degree and PhD from the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom, followed by roles in the analysis of orthopedic implants and battery materials performing before joining Kite in 2016. Jonathan has over 15 years of experience in analysis of technologies and vibrational spectros spectroscopy. We're really excited to have him here today. Jonathan's a new member to AOCS. He joined us last November, and um, the company has been involved with AOCS as the exhibitor um, in the past year. So we welcome Jonathan, and Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you all. Uh, I hope you're having a good day so far. So. First things first, I have put my email on the front slide here. Please feel free to reach out at any time. I am more than happy to take questions, uh, start conversations. That's part of my job and I enjoy doing it. So by all means, please do feel free to reach out. And obviously there's time for questions uh, at the end of today's webinar as well. So uh, what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna give you a very brief background of who Kite Spectrometers are and where we came from. I then want to move on to PAT, Process Analytical Technologies, and go into a little bit of detail about what that is and how that fits into spectroscopy, and then talk about spectroscopy itself. So some of the benefits of spectroscopy, uh, why I believe you should consider it, and, and the value that it brings to uh, oil refining in particular, but, but across all industries. And then go into our product itself, uh, a couple of specifics on that, and then give you some technical data on work that we've done so far and uh, results from both the laboratory and actually uh, in industrial processes too, and then a couple of conclusions before throwing it open to questions. So the obligatory company intro slide, uh, it wouldn't be a true webinar without one of those now, would it? Uh, Kite Spectrometers, uh, we're a spin-out from a government research lab, uh, originally actually looking at space technology, and I've got a, a slide later on that, that goes into that in a bit more detail. We are based in Oxford that we always think is in the middle of the country uh, and it's kind of broadly in the middle of, of England, but we kind of forget there's quite a lot of Scotland uh, further north enough. So we're quite far in the south, but it's, it's the lovely verdant green pastures of England. It's a, it's a lovely place to be. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity, do come in and visit Oxfordshire. It's, it's a beautiful part of the world. Uh, our technology was, as I say, originally developed for, for a Mars research project, um, and it's based on static optics. I'll go into more detail what that is a little bit later, but effectively we developed a way of making spectrometers where nothing has to move. Everything is fixed, it's all in one place, and that means it's about as robust as your bathroom mirror. And when was the last time you recalibrated your bathroom mirror? Uh, people may wish to recalibrate them, but unfortunately what they show you is fact. So, so that's who we are. Let's get on to the interesting stuff. PAT, what is PAT and, and why is it useful? So you may or may not know, but we're actually in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. So there was the first industrial revolution that has the name, the industrial revolution. Uh, it's the most famous one, late 18th century, and it was mechanization. It was when people started to be able to use equipment and machines to do the job that people used to do and it effectively came about from the steam engine the steam engine became efficient james watt actually made a way of making it efficient using condensers and that kick-started the whole industrial revolution then a bit later in the late 19th early uh, to mid 20th century came along the second industrial revolution and this was mass production uh, these are things like uh, henry ford building automobiles with the production line electricity allowed the division of labor it, it was a way of improving efficiencies that had come about from the original Industrial Revolution. Then at the back end of the second half of the, the second, 20th century, we had the third Industrial Revolution. Uh, they decided at this point to call it the Digital Revolution. Uh, and this is automation, electronics and IT. This is effectively the silicon chip. 
enabling digital processing and computers to take a much more leading role. And we are now in what's uh, been given the, uh, the, the sexy name of Industry 4.0. Uh, and this is the fourth industrial revolution. And this is going beyond just computers. This is computers talking to other computers, talking to equipment, the robotization, cyber physical systems, and digitalization. This is the beginning of fully automated processes. Uh, an example that, that I come across quite a lot is the uh, an oil rig with no people running it. So the, uh, the ma unmanned oil rig, something that can sit out in the middle of the ocean and it can take crude oil from the sea, get it to the point where it can go down a pipeline or into a tanker for refining later on with absolutely no human involvement. The plant, or the, in this case the oil rig, has sensors that talk to each other and it just knows what to do. Now, we're actually quite a long way away from that, but that is where people want to get to. And, and that's what we're living through at the moment. To do that and to enable uh, uh, cyber physical systems that interface with reality and talk to each other and make decisions, we need sensors. And you need to be able to understand what your process is actually doing. Broadly speaking, there are three types of analytical measurements. There are simple online measurements. We tend to call these parametric. They're things like pH probes, temperature probes, oxygen levels, turbidity measurements, optical density measurements. So they're very simple. They measure one thing, but they do it all the time. And then at the other extreme end of that, we have things that are offline measurements, such as uh, high performance liquid chromatography, chemical assays. These can directly monitor concentrations and give you really meaningful information, but they're very slow. You need to take a sample offline. It's difficult to automate that, and they can be very expensive. Then in the middle, we have spectroscopic measurements. And I'm gonna go into spectroscopy in a bit more detail later, but that's kind of halfway between the two. Spectroscopic measurements do look at the chemicals that are present, and they do it in real time, but they're not, they don't give as much information uh, or the, the uh, precision of information that some of the offline measurements can give. So let's let's look a little bit into some of those simple online measurements in a bit more detail and understand what those are. There's quite a lot of them. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are ones that we come across quite a lot and that customers tend to have installed on their processes already. So at the left, we've got capacitive measurements. These are things like uh, electrical sensors that actually sit in the process. They're very good for biotech, where you're trying to look at things like cell growth, but not so good for, for oil processing. Refractometers, uh, they can be quite good. They tend to be single wavelength of light, and they look at the refractive index of a process. So if you're trying to look at one thing and one thing only, uh, for example, water dissolved in, in edible oils, uh, that could be done with a refractometer but your process needs to sit at an exact temperature because the refractive index of that mixture will be changed by the amount of water present, but it will also be changed by the temperature. And you can't tell whether it's the temperature or the water that's causing that change in refractive index. So if you've got very tight control and you know that you've got a complete uh, uh, control over temperature, that's a really good type of measurement. If you don't have control, these measurements start to fall over. Optical density does something similar. Uh, that can be linked to something like a colorometer that looks for color. So if you're trying to look at the color of your, uh, your process, um, that, that kind of measurement could be done in a similar way. Temperature probes, we've all used temperature probes. We've all used a thermometer ever since uh, we were a tiny child. I suspect somebody has at some point taken your temperature. There are loads of different types of temperature probes. You can have uh, the traditional old school mercury based ones going right the way up to uh, infrared light based ones that are work off reflectance and everything in between. I think we all know how those can be used. pH probes, you might want to measure the pH. These work very well in aqueous media, but in uh, non aqueous media, pH isn't terribly easy to measure. Uh, so, for example, free fatty acid concentration by pH is probably very difficult, if not impossible. Dissolved oxygen probes, they are very good for things like biotech, where you're trying to, if you've got an aerobic process, you're trying to pump as much oxygen in that as possible. Uh, but for things like edible oils, they're less, less helpful. Ion-specific electrodes, again, work very well with, uh, or get, uh, with um, aqueous methods where certain ions can dissolve and they're mobile. So for example, looking at things like calcium or magnesium ions can be done with ion-specific electrodes, 
but only in aqueous phase. So if you were to take an oil and wash it with water, you might be able to extract certain ions into that and then detect them, but that kind of becomes an offline measurement at that point and not truly online. And lastly, you've got molecule specific sensors. Uh, a really common one of these is glucose. Anyone that knows anyone with diabetes will have seen these, where you can take a drop of blood, put it on a, a sugar a glucose level stick. That works with an immobilized enzyme. I believe it's um, horseradish peroxidase that looks at the amount of glucose present and gives you a, it actually gives you a, a current and a voltage, and that tells you how much glucose is present. So there's a huge variety of different online measurements, but none of these really give you the information that would allow online control of things like seed oil refining. And then at the other end of that, we've got the offline and extractive measurements. Uh, and these, broadly speaking, fall into three categories. We've got the, the chemical and biochemical assays. We've got direct instrumentation measurements and then chromatographic techniques. So the, the chemical and biochemical assays, these fall into things like titrations, uh, free fatty acid titrations, for example, are, are, are quite commonplace, and chemical reactions. Um, there is a fantastic book that some of you may have come across by Vogel that lists every single chemical assay uh, around, but there are lots of them. It is it's not light reading, uh, but there are absolutely hundreds of different chemical reactions that can be done for quantitative and qualitative analytical chemistry, but they're all very slow, very expensive, and they require skilled technicians. They're not trivial. The direct instrumentation, things like nuclear magnetic resonance, um, and I've just spotted my deliberate mistake, that should say ICP, not IPC, uh, AES and AAS, these actually do take direct measurements uh, of chemical concentrations, but again, these require skill technicians to run, and they often need dilution and reference standards as well. And then at the other end, we have chromatographic techniques, things like HPLC, LCMS, GCMS. These all need, um, the, the MS stands for mass spectrometry, and those actually are effectively the detector. But HPLC needs to be bolted onto a detector. It is effectively a posh sieve, and a sieve is great, but you do need something at the other end to do something with what's been separated and they almost always need dilution. And you've got to take the samples offline. You've got to go and actually extract them at some point. And we've tend to notice, we're working with customers and clients, that samples taken at around about this time of day are normally quite trustworthy. Samples taken at 2 a.m., less so. Uh, and that's simply because people get tired. It, it happens. So these techniques are very powerful, but they all have drawbacks. So we've either at one end got the simple online measurements that don't really give you the information you need to make a change and offline measurements that aren't, can't be done quickly enough to make a change. And this is where spectroscopy comes in. So I'm gonna very quickly at a top level go through what spectroscopy actually is because I appreciate some people on this call may have spent lots of time doing spectroscopy, may may be really experts in it, and some people may have never come across it before. So I'm just going to run through it very briefly at a top level, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Spectroscopy starts with a bulb. Uh, this is my, my badly drawn light bulb uh, that generates a light source. So this is our light source. It generates light of the wavelength we need for spectroscopy. And we can use any type of wavelength, and I, I go into that on the next slide, but we have to generate our, our, our light in some way. This light is then shone through the sample of interest. So we have to get the light from the bulb to the sample somehow. The sample itself either absorbs or emits light depending on the type of spectroscopy we're looking at, but effectively it changes the light in some way. So then our new beam of light, it's a different color to start with, so it's, on, it's changed light, has to then go into the rest of the spectrometer. And then we have some kind of optics that manages this light and breaks it up into such a way that we can put it onto a detector and come to a conclusion as to what it is. And you see spectroscopy every single day. If you've ever walked into a room with a light bulb, that light bulb gives out white light. It gives a, it gives a range of different lights uh, and they all average out to be white light. If nothing ever changed the light, then everything in the room would look pure white because they would just be reflecting that light back at us but they don't. Everything in the room looks the color of whatever it is. I'm currently sitting in my study. I can see some 
some black furniture, I can see some green furniture, I can see some lovely magnolia walls. They're all reflecting the light at different colours, and that is, in its simplest form, spectroscopy. What we do uh, as spectroscopists is take that data and turn it into a quantitative measurement. We see how much of that light comes out green, how much of that light comes out red, and that's what spectroscopy is. As I said, there are loads of different types of spectroscopy. This is the electromagnetic wave, uh, uh, spectrum, and we can use pretty much all of it. So at one end, we have the high energy short wavelength lights, and that's down here with the gamma rays and X-rays. And we tend to use that for looking at crystal structures. We then move into UV, and we tend to lump that together with visible light, and we call it UV vis. And that looks at electronic transitions uh, within molecules, uh, which is uh, higher energy than infrared. And infrared looks at vibration within molecules. So that is the chemical bonds within a molecule vibrating. So if we think of something like a water molecule, we have our oxygen in the middle, and we have two hydrogens, one on either side, and that oxygen to hydrogen bond can vibrate. And that's what we're seeing. Molecules are basically made up of springs. They're atoms that are all connected by springs, and all of those springs vibrate at different frequencies and wavelengths, and that's what infrared light looks at. Then we have microwaves. Microwaves look at rotations of molecules, because molecules don't just sit there. They don't sit doing nothing, they're constantly moving, and the rotation frequency and energy corresponds with microwave. And then radio waves are what we use for nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, or MRI. Anyone that's ever had an MRI scan uh, has had radio waves shown onto them uh, in a giant magnet, and that is basically all that is. So the whole spectrum we can use for spectroscopy. For PAT, we tend to focus on UV vis, near infrared, and infrared. The near infrared, by the way, is this bit, uh, sorry, it's just here, this bit just here between the red that we can see and the infrared. That's what the near means. It means close to the bit that we can see. So we have near infrared here, we have mid infrared in the middle, and far infrared, which is the stuff that's far away. It's not a complicated naming system. So for online spectroscopy, we have UV visible and fluorescence, and these both use the ultraviolet frequencies and a little bit of the visible, and that's electronic. The good for this is their simple interpretation of the results, and they can be very sensitive, but they only work for a few niche applications. You, you need a molecule that undergoes an electronic transition, and that means it has to have double bonds and triple bonds inside it. Single bond saturated molecules don't tend to undergo those transitions. So for example, the vast majority of free fatty acids, certainly the saturated free fatty acids, would be very difficult to analyze with UV vis. The carbonyl peak in those might do something, but it's it's not going to be a trivial measurement to make. And then we have this, this grouping of vibrational measurements down here. And we have Raman spectroscopy, which is a very special type of spectroscopy. I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. It's, it's like mid-infrared in the type of information it gives you, but the, the, there is something called a selection rule for it, which is dwelling far too close to quantum physics for a, a lunchtime webinar um, that makes it very difficult to use for some applications. And it can fluoresce, and fluorescence with Raman can make it very difficult to use. And then we have near-infrared, classical mid-infrared, and the, the static optics infrared of the, what I'm talking about today. Um, they're both in the, the mid infrared and static optics infrared are both very information rich, but the moving parts in mid infrared make them unsuitable for industrial applications. So they have a set of mirrors that have to move along a track, and that track must be extremely well determined and well controlled. If there's any vibration present, that track becomes much harder to understand and it throws off the instrument. Getting around that with things like fiber optics, the fibers are far too fragile and they can literally get broken or they can be bent out of place or it makes them very unsuitable for manufacturing environments. I'm gonna talk about near infrared in more detail in a second. So how do we actually use spectroscopy? We have to build a calibration. So it isn't inherently quantitative. We do have to build that calibration first. So the first thing we do is we acquire calibration spectra. We can either do that by making a sample set up in the laboratory, or we can piggyback on normal production runs and campaigns, especially when there is a natural variation in the process. And I've got a couple of slides, uh, one for each uh, in a minute. And then we use a reference set of concentrations, 
um, we use the two together to build a calibration model. Now you can do this using the classical way of, of peak heights, uh, where we use something called Beer's Law, or you can use chemometrics, which we use almost exclusively. It is orders of magnitude more powerful. It looks at the entire spectrum in one go and pulls out the individual subspectra of different chemicals. It's a bit like trying to read a barcode by eye. A human might be able to recognize a barcode if they have a reference for it, but trying to read multiple barcodes overlapping on top of each other, impossible. But a computer can pull that out, and that's what Chemometrics does for us. And then once that calibration model's been built, we take offline samples randomly to validate it, because that's good science. You don't want to install something that might not work. And we do constant statistical checks on that to check that the model is working as it should do. And I'm happy to go into more detail on those later on, but they're, they're not part of the main flow of this, uh, this presentation. So near infrared, some of you may be sat there thinking, yeah, we heard all about infrared before. It was gonna fix everything, and it didn't. I tried a near infrared and it was awful. It was expensive, it took me ages to calibrate, it didn't work. I must stress this, near infrared and mid infrared, or FTIR as it's sometimes called, are different. They are very, very different. Unfortunately, the infrared part of their name is the same, but they are very different. They're both based on vibrational information, but the quality of the information is, is completely different. So this is as close to quantum physics as I'm going to get, I promise. When we have a UV vis spectroscopy, so this is the electronic, or mid-infrared, also called FTIR, we have a fundamental spectroscopic interaction. So we start in this, this what's called the ground state. And in electronic, we jump up a rung of this electronic ladder, and you'll notice we're in the still in the vibrational ground state up here, but we've just jumped up an electronic state. And for mid infrared, we start in the vibrational ground state and jump up to the vibrational excited state. In both these cases, we've only gone up one rung on that ladder, which means it's very easy to understand what has happened and what's caused that to happen. For near infrared, we jump up multiple rungs on that ladder. And it's very difficult to work out how many rungs you've jumped up, what this actually correlates to, and what you're looking at. What that means is that near infrared, so this, this is called combination and overtones rather than fundamental transitions, they are much harder to identify. And near infrared struggles to differentiate between similar molecules. For example, free fatty acids, cis trans isomers, monodi and triglycerides identifying the difference of those with near infrared is extremely difficult and requires a lot of calibration standards and that is probably why if any of you did try it and it didn't work that's why it didn't work it is a really hard technique now for things like solids and you just want to look at a classic example is water in meat uh, or water in grain or probably water in seeds nir does a reasonable job of that but trying to get down to the more detailed in situ processing in liquids is much, much harder. I like to use this as an example of the type of different information we get. With near infrared, you effectively get a silhouette. It's that kind of granularity of information. And here we have a picture. Is it a vase or a vase uh, or is it two faces? So are we looking at the white or are we looking at the black? With mid infrared, we get very, very clear that it's a vase. That's what we're looking at. We get that depth, we get much more information. We can really understand what's going on. One last thing to, to kind of drive home this point is that with a conventional ATR, which is the type of probe that we use on our, our technology, only one or two microns worth of light actually extends beyond the, the probe. So that's this tiny little bit here, which is down here which is absolutely tiny compared to things like bubbles or even solids. In, in crude oil, you may have solids floating around, you may have bubbles because of pumps. The light in mid-infrared doesn't interact with that. It looks at the liquid only. And when things are dissolved in liquid, we effectively have a constant concentration of that and it works really well. With near-infrared, we have to use a reflectance probe uh, or a transmission probe, which is effectively the same type of optics because you need a much, much longer path length to get any meaningful information. That light has to be reflected back again. 
Now, for an ideal scenario, that's absolutely fine. Light comes up, hits the polished surface and reflects back again. But the second you have bubbles or particles, you either refract the light, which changes its path length, which makes them much harder to calibrate, or you block the light, which changes everything and makes it much harder to calibrate. And because of all of those reasons, NIR, whilst powerful for certain applications, is really hard to use for liquid and online control. So, moving on to our static optics. Our instrument is 30 centimetres long, 24 centimetres wide, it's got a sensing probe, it's got an armoured shell, and we thought to ourselves, what else has a sensing probe and an armoured shell and is about that size? It's an armadillo. Uh, and it's important in the world of infrared technology to have a pun on IR. So our product is called the IR Modillo. Uh, I was thinking at some point of trying to bolt a couple of ears on the front of it, but was told that was uh, possibly going a step too far. How did we get from, from Mars to an industrial process analytical uh, technology piece of work? We started in 2009, so we've been going for just over 10 years. Uh, and when we started, we called it the Micro FDS, uh, was the original inspiration, and it cost £5,000 for a proof of concept. That's how much it cost us to to get this, this first proof of concept going from effectively mirrors they could find in the lab and bolting it together. And an intern at the government lab uh, tried to explore the, the commercial potential. At that point, we went from 5,000 to 600,000 to secure funding to actually turn this into a product. There were two staff, they had a, a signal to noise ratio of five units. And it, you know, it was stable for about 30 seconds before it fell over. But at that point, in 2013, Kite was founded. Uh, the idea was that, yep, this is something that might actually work. And we decided to look at gas, gas emissions. We then realized that that was gonna not work very well. So in 2015, we decided to shift our focus towards mid-infrared process control of liquids and slurries. And we haven't looked back since then. That has been our, our pure focus. We got 1.4 million pounds worth of funding and we increased our staff to seven. And we managed to expand our SNR from five to 150. And the instrument was stable for about a week, a week to a month. But at that point, we started talking to customers and we went out and we trialed with our prototype. And then we created an actual product, the IR Modelo 25. The 25 means that the, the probe is 25 millimeters in diameter or, or one metric inch, as I tend to call it. Uh, by that point, we'd consumed five million pounds, but we had an IP65 rated instrument with ATEC certification. That's similar to class one div two uh, that you may, may have come across in your industries. Um, we do actually now have class one div two rating for our instrument as well. Uh, it's got ISO certification. We had 12 staff and an SNR of 1,200, and it was stable for a year. But you couldn't see IP it. If you tried to put any caustic uh, past the probe, it would dissolve. So we created the Iomodillo Diamond, and that's where we are now. We've now consumed two and a half million pounds worth of funding. Uh, sorry, we've secured an additional uh, two and a half million pounds worth of funding. Uh, we have 14 staff. The SNR is the same, the stability is the same, but you can now put the probe in pretty much anything. So how does it work? This is the clever arrangement of mirrors I alluded to earlier. We start off with an emitter in the probe itself, and this emits light. It's basically a posh LED but this em emits infrared light. This light comes out towards the end of the probe and goes through what's called attenuated total reflection. This is the ATR I mentioned earlier. A little bit of the light, only a tiny bit, extends beyond the end of the probe and into the sample. It's about two microns worth of light. And it interacts with the sample and then ends up back in the probe again. And then we shoot this down towards this point here called a beam splitter. Now, if you've ever put your head against the window of a train or a car and you've seen your own reflection whilst looking outside at the same time, that's a beam splitter. Uh, I do apologize, my home phone's ringing, it will stop in a second. That's a beam splitter. So half the light is reflected around this track here. So this yellow light of track goes anti-clockwise round the process and goes up onto this detector here. The rest of the light goes through and goes clockwise around this arrangement of mirrors and hits the detector here. These two beams of light are slightly offset and that creates an interference pattern. That interference pattern can undergo what's called a Fourier transform and that's the FT in FTIR to create a spectrum. 
Um, you may remember interference patterns from if you ever did the young slits experiment at school. It's the same thing. That spectrum we can then send through to a computer and we can analyze and we can do something with. And, and that's what I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about. Some results, results that we actually have in the lab. I'm not going to show you raw spectra. By all means, I'm happy to, to email them over to people. We have an application note written about this that has the spectra in it. Um, and I, as I say, I'll be more than happy to, to talk about it, but I'm going to go on to what we do with that information. So this is a qualitative measurement. This is called a scores plot. So for those who are familiar with chemometrics, this is a principal component analysis. What we basically do is we pull out the information. So PC1 is the biggest piece of information that's actually present in the spectra we see. PC2 is the second biggest piece of information. PC3 would be the third biggest and so on. And then this number down here tells us how much of that variation is captured by that. So 86% of all the change we see in our spectra is captured by PC1. The next 10% is captured by PC2. Add those two together and you've got 96. That's a huge amount of your variation already captured. And in this sample, we were looking at different types of oil and adulterated oils. Now, I appreciate adulterated oils for oil refining may well not be a problem, but it's a good example of showing the types of things that you can pull out with uh, mid-infrared. And you've probably seen similar graphs to this with near-infrared, because this is a classic go-to that someone wants to demonstrate their near-infrared. So we thought we'd start there too. So down here, we've got pure soybean oil. Up here, we have pure canola oil. And unsurprisingly, in between the two of them, we have a canola and soybean oil mix because it does literally say, well, you've got features of both, we sit in the middle. And then we have different types. Of, we have pure olive oil here. We have started to adulterate our olive oil with canola oil, and that's why it's drifted up towards the canola oil. And then we have uh, olive oil that's been adulterated with soybean. And unsurprisingly, it starts to drift down towards the soybean oil. Computers can pull this out and statistically generate a likelihood as what type of oil that is, as well as telling you how much adulteration there is. So you can do that on real time and update every minute or two minutes of a continual pipeline if required. As I said, I appreciate for refining that may well not be terribly useful, but this is the kind of information that could happen towards the back end of a process to check your within specification qualitatively as well as quantitatively. And I should point out that spectroscopy, all types of spectrometers, can run multiple calibrations at the same time. So you can have a calibration that looks for something qualitatively whilst also making a quantitative measurement at the same time with one instrument. We then went on to look at some quantitative measurements. So this is free fatty acid and fatty acid methyl esters dissolved in sunflower oil. So again, this is laboratory conditions. I appreciate these are effectively ideal conditions from clean samples. But we, we dissolved both FAMES and FFAs in the same mixture. So they're both present at once, and there are lots of different types. I cannot remember off the top of my head how many FFAs and FAMES there are, but I think there are at least six of each. So we've got things like linoleic, oleic, linolenic, palmitic acids present, and their FAME equivalents. And for this, we managed to build calibrations with a, a typical error, which is our effectively our limit of detection of 0.24% for FFA and 0.06% for FAME within this concentration range. The errors are partially to do with the concentration ranges that you look at. So if you only look at lower concentrations, you tend to get a lower error. If you look at higher concentrations, you tend to get a higher error. Uh, but that's just statistics. That's the way that these models work. But I, I hope you'll agree these results are actually pretty good uh, and encouraging enough to, to move on to something like a plant trial, which is what one of our customers did. And they very graciously let us use their data to, to share with you what they've managed to achieve. So these are results from an oil refinery. The instrument is installed quite far downstream. This is actually right towards the end, just before the, uh, the packaging step. And that's simply because it's an easy place for them to install the instrument as a proof of concept. After having seen these results, they've decided to move the instrument right upstream before the uh, the, the caustic, the, the lye mixing, so that they can actually control that based on a real-time FFA measurement. So they were so pleased that they have moved it upstream or are doing so as we speak. We're trying to wait until they can get contractors back on site because coronavirus has caused problems for absolutely everyone. So in these results, these are actual samples taken from online. 
So we were installed online for continuous measurements, and this is the calibration. So for, for FFA, in lots of different oil types, you may be asking yourself or, or, or thinking, yes, but do I have to have a calibration for every oil? This refinery processes at least two, if not three or four different types of oil, and we built one calibration for that, regardless whether it's sunflower, whether it's canola, whether it's high oleic, uh, oleic sorry, low oleic, it, it, it's one calibration for all of them. And in this case, the limited detection was 0 0.083. So you can see that's improved on before because we're looking at the lower concentrations. We also managed to see chlorophyll. Now, I was actually quite surprised by this because these numbers are low, less than one ppm. These are extremely low values for spectroscopy, but we managed to pull out a calibration. We then ran this calibration in real time and looked at, uh, it was something like four weeks worth of data, which is what I've got here. So we've got the instrument was installed halfway through February and left online till halfway through March. And for the FFA measurements, uh, we can basically see they were trying to hit for a 0.1% specification and the vast majority of time were within that. But not long after installing the instrument, they drifted outside of specification. And this gap here is approximately 12 hours. And it was 12 hours before they took their offline sample analyzed it and realized they were outside of spec and then did something about it and they overcompensated now this may have been deliberate it may have been accidental but they overcompensated for it with and it was another six hours or so before they took a reference point and then they start to drift back up again with online real technology real-time measurements they would have known about it, the uh, the fact that they were drifting outside of specification there the second it started to happen we have updated these spectra every two minutes. So every two minutes you get a measurement. You might want to wait for seven measurements. Statistical process control tells you that's a good time to wait to see if you're outside of uh, uh, process control uh, boundaries. So seven measurements, two minutes per measurement, that's 14 minutes compared to 12 hours, at which point you can do something about it. And you can then feed that result forward through to your, your dosing control and you can adjust it and maintain much, much better control so you use less chemical, which is cheaper. You don't go outside of specification, so you never have to worry about throwing away any batch, and you you have much better control over everything. You can then also use that for things like controlling centrifuges to make sure that you're not throwing away oil in your water stream or that you have no water in your oil stream. The possibilities are quite exciting. The chlorophyll measurements are, they're okay. They're reasonable. Um, we can, I, I, I stress again, we're below one ppm. So I'm I'm actually, I'm impressed myself that this, this, this works at this kind of detection limits. They're more for trends, I, I think. Um, if you had a spike of chlorophyll or something weird had happened and there was a huge amount of chlorophyll contamination, you would spot it. Uh, but within this number, it's more for a trend than fine control at this type of value. So what else is in our pipeline? Uh, phosphoric acid dosing. I'm aware that that is another uh, area of interest. Infrared should not directly be able to measure metal ions, but we can. We believe from previous experiments in other technologies, think we can see the effect that the metal ions have on the spectra of the phosphoric, uh, the, the phospholipids themselves, and the uh, any free fatty acids that may be chelated to them as well. So we've got some samples actually arriving from a customer very soon, where we're going to start building calibration on that. Trying to build lab samples of phospholipids and metals in oil is, is not even worth trying. It, it's too difficult to do. Um, this is much more sensible to do with real life process samples. So we are expecting those imminently and we will work on them and publish an application note as soon as we're able to. The other thing we can do is measure things like properties. Um, iodine value, which I know is, is effectively the, the degree of unsaturation within your process, We've just finished doing our proof of concept work on that, where we bought a variety of pure triglycerides with known iodine values. And from that, we were able to give an error of plus or minus four uh, on, on the iodine value, uh, ranging from zero up to, I think, 260 was the highest number that we got. And again, we'll, we'll write that up and, and publish that available for, for dissemination as soon as we've done it. But I throw the question to yourselves. If there are things you'd like to measure, we're more than happy to do it. We've got a laboratory, we've got instruments, we can take samples. We would love to look at your samples for you and, and actually get some meaningful data for you and hopefully start a relationship. So conclusions, uh, we are at the point 
where closed loop control and real time process optimization for complicated processes is realistically within reach, but it does require things like spectroscopic measurements. And people are beginning to roll this out and they're making real efficiency savings, um, game changing efficiency savings. Uh, and it's a really exciting time to be involved in this. The use of robust FTIR instruments allows for the control of chemicals in refining. Um, we know about it in loads of different industries because I'm lucky enough to work in lots of different industries, but we have now be beginning to get the impetus, the movement here to, to, to roll this out into things like seed oil refining. And the key difference is that the static optics of the I armadillo allows you to bring the information rich from the FTIR out of the laboratory and into an industrial setting. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for that uh, presentation. It's very interesting. We do have some questions, so I'm going to hopefully find all these. And um, the first question is related to how can we use FTIT for biodiesel analysis and how reliable and cost effective is the process? Okay. So biodiesel analysis would effectively be taking the triglycerides and breaking those down into uh, the esters, uh, so transesterification and producing glycerol. So we know that we can see glycerol with FTIR. That's that's very easy to do. Um, glycerol's got a beautiful. Um, I'm aware that I'm sounding a bit like a spectroscopy geek now, but it's got a beautiful FTIR spectrum. It's very easy to see. And again, we we showed the the fatty acid methyl esters earlier. Um, we know we can identify those. So you can certainly do that. You can either use it for dosing in things like the catalyst of sodium methoxide, uh, or you can use it for enzymatic processes to check that the actual process is operating within spec, control temperature feedback loops, control dosing feedback. We, we know it can be done, but we haven't actually worked with a customer to do so yet. So if, if the, the asker would like to reach out to me, I'd be more than happy to, to start a conversation there of, of how to do that. The cost effectiveness, it depends on where your pinch point in your process is. So if it allows you to run at a, producing a higher, so for, for example, I don't know whether this is a chemical or enzymatic process. Um, if it allows you to run it closer towards a ceiling of uh, a point where you would poison your own process, then you can produce more product very quickly. And those uh, that return on the investment comes back very, very quickly. If it's more about controlling chemical dosing, uh, and reducing wastage, then of course it depends on where the most expensive chemical is. Chemicals like sodium methoxide are expensive. They're, they're not cheap to use. So if you can reduce that cost or be as efficient as possible with the cost of that, then the return on the investment calculations uh, are quite easy to do. Um, I'm not at liberty to start talking about list prices and things on the call, that's, that's more for our commercial team. Um, but it, we've, we've done some calculations with customers and it's normally around about a one year's return on the investment. Excellent, very good. So another question that's come in is, is it able to find adulteration of vegetable oil or animal body fat with milk fat? Oh, uh, I don't know because I haven't done it, but it, it's highly likely. So we've looked at milk before and we've pulled out protein levels in milk, fat levels in milk, sugar levels in milk, different types of sugars. Uh, we've not differentiated the fats because the lab we are working with could only do total fat, but we know we can quantitate milk fats. And we know that we can quantitate individual triglycerides, free fatty acids and fames. So I expect we certainly can, but I would want to do the work in order to, to give you detection limits. But we, we, almost certainly I, I, I would, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can. Excellent. Uh, another question is, what is the LOD limit for detection of the adulterated oil? At what percent level adul adulteration is detected? I wish I could remember that because we did look it up. Um, I'm not sure. I, I will have to look it up. We do have an application note about adulteration. So I will make sure that gets linked somehow, somewhere. Um, I know in the virtual conference, we've, we've got some, some stuff that we're putting up. So I'll make sure that's up there um, with that number. Um, it was quite low, I think, um, but I'm not sure. I would have to double check. Okay, great. 
Another question is, we want to measure 0.05 to 0.5 free fatty acid, FFA, in the refined palm oil. Is that possible to measure that low level? So that was 0.05, did you say? That is correct, yes. 0.05. So on this particular data set here, uh, we've got to 0.08, uh, which is not too far off from that, certainly the same order of magnitude. And you'll notice that some of our, we, we have a reasonable amount of spread of data, but a lot of it's up here. Um, so almost certainly we probably could. I also know that this point of the installation was slightly suboptimal. There were a couple of things about flow rate that weren't quite right that we're, we're rectifying for the new install. So I, I suspect we probably could, yes, um, get down to 0.05. Uh, and it, it's partially about the calibration and the way you do it. Uh, and if we can get something that is uh, super pure as a reference, effectively a 0% or as close to as possible, include that in the calibration, uh, then we should be able to get uh, extremely uh, accurate. So uh, yes, I think we can. Good, good. Another one is, can we measure online phosphorus P, PPM in the refined palm oil? So we wouldn't measure direct phosphorus because we have to measure the, the spectrum of a molecule rather than an atom. But what we would do is we would be measuring the spectra of different phosphatides, uh, phospholipids, and basically summing those all up to correlate that into a phosphorus number. So obviously what you really care about is the amount of phosphorus, which you can get from things like atomic emission spectroscopy or other technologies. And we would have to do a, a little bit of maths, simple maths, but, but a little bit of maths that basically turns the concentration of the phosphatide and adding them all up with their respective percentage of phosphorus into PPM values. So yes, um, I don't know what the limits are because we haven't been able to establish it yet, but we know we can look for phosphatides. So yes, it is something we can do, but I don't yet know what the numbers are. Uh, and I'm relying on, on everyone listening to, to hopefully be able to send in some samples that we can analyze to get those numbers. Excellent. Well, I'm looking through the questions. Um, I feel like I've covered them all. Um, we, um, all attendees, registrants will receive this as a, uh, a recording. Um, they will get Jonathan's contact information. So I encourage you to reach out to him for follow up questions. Um, he's also going to be participating in the upcoming virtual AOCS annual meeting. Um, so we thank you for that participation, both as a presenter, as an exhibitor. So I think um, if I, as long as I'm seeing everything here correctly, Jonathan, really want to thank you so much for your participation. You've done you. really well, some really excellent information here. Great audience. And I'd like to thank everyone for being a part of the AOCS webinar Wednesday.